Now we are coming to the end of this Bible class, and I hope that it's given you an appreciation and an understanding of the Bible, but I hope that it's also encouraged you to uh, delve deeper and to study the Word and to stay in the Word. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. The Bible is not a book that's meant to be read through once. It's a book that's meant to be studied and, and really delved into. Um, and I hope that this has is, is caused you some, some, some better understanding of that. Please feel free to check out my other videos. And um, I have other classes too. I have a Growing in Christ uh, Discipleship class. I have um, uh, Old Testament Made Easy and a New Testament Made Easy, which, which kind of elaborates on, on this. It's a lot more complicated of, of a version of this, and it's an, a little longer too, way longer. Um, and so feel free to check that out. Um, I also have other videos um, uh, that I've taught for young adult classes and, and different things like that. Feel free to check them out and, and see if there's anything that really helps you to grow um, as a Christian. So that takes us to Philemon. Um, and this was written by Paul. So remember, Paul has been um, arrested, and he is in Rome, imprisoned, okay, in the early 60s. So Philemon is one of the one of the letters that Paul wrote while he was imprisoned. Um, and he wrote this to a man by the name of Philemon, uh, who lived in uh, Colossae, okay? So, um, this was in uh, the six, the early 60s, 61. And so what had happened was uh, Philemon had this slave by the name of um, Ones 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 Onesimus. I forget how, how you pronounce it. Onesimus, something like that. Anyways, um, and it was Philemon's uh, slave. And evidently what had happened was he ran away and had gotten saved. And Paul had sent him back to Philemon, but sent him with also this letter as kind of like a plea for him. Um, and there's a lot of things that the Bible says about slavery. And um, let me just kind of clarify a few things. First off, the Bible does not condone slavery. And I think that needs to be noted. Um, a lot of times people have have misunderstood the word or um, tried to uh, manipulate it or whatever towards their leanings or towards their bias, but the Bible does not condone it. Um, also, um, slavery uh, back then was not like slavery, um, how we think of it today in modern terms. Um, uh, it, um, it was about either you were in debt by a lot or so you sold, sold yourself to slavery, or um, you were uh, a people group that had been conquered by, uh, you know, the Romans, for instance, and so you had been done to slavery. It wasn't so much about racism, how we think of it nowadays. Um, excuse me. Um, and, and a key theme of Philemon is overlook offenses. Even if you have the right, overlook. Standing in the gap for someone. Paul barely met this uh, Onesimus, and yet he stood in the gap between him and his, his estranged master. Um, really just a, a powerful story. Colossians and Ephesians were both written right around the same time as Philemon as well, about 61, early on in, in Paul's Roman impris imprisonment. Um, <clears throat> and what's, what, what had happened was uh, the church in Colossae is, was in danger of combining heresies with the truth. Like a lot of, of the early church's struggles, um, they were unsure of, of where the line was and, and how to how to adapt to this new way of life. Um, the content is very similar to Ephesians. Uh, yeah. uh, Col Colossians just kind of has a little bit of a different um, theme, but same, a very similar content. And it's interesting, though, because shortly after this epistle was written, or this letter was written, the city of Colossae was actually destroyed, um, I believe, by... Um, I want to say earthquake, but I'm not positive about that. It was a natural disaster of some kind, if I remember correctly, uh, but I don't remember exactly the, the, the details. Um, but the Colossians were, were just didn't quite, they were kind of going to two extremes. Either Christ was fully human or Christ was fully God. They didn't see how it could mesh together. And so at the theme then of Colossians is that Christ, the man, is God, if that makes sense. Um, so here was kind of what they were doing and in, in swaying to the belief. Um, on, on one side, they were saying Christ um, is not God. He's not fully God. Um, in which case, Christians are not saved. 
and you must add works, and so they need to do all the little things, all the rituals. They needed to do that to grow in maturity. But then on the other hand, there are some people who are saying, okay, but Christ was not Christ is not actually a human. He is divine and only maybe appeared to be human. So then that would mean the Christians are also not saved. And so um, uh, that they were then only saved uh, in their spirit, not their body. They were not fully saved. Um, in which case, the spirit was saved and nothing could change that, but the body could do whatever it wants. See what I mean? So they were kind of... Some people thought, oh, we need to do things to, to get fully saved. And other people thought, well... It doesn't matter what we do because we are saved. See what I mean? So it kind of just caught in the balance of that. And Colossians brings kind of a nice little um, conclusion to that to that thing because that's that's something that the people nowadays still struggle to struggle with as well. So then Ephesians, like I said, was written um, about the same time as Colossians. Very similar content. Um, it was possibly written to Laodicea. Um, it, it, the earliest manuscripts don't actually say to Ephesus. Um, and so it's very possible that Paul, Paul talks about a letter that he wrote to Laodicea. It's very possible that this was that letter. Um, and it maybe just got attached to Ephesians later, or maybe it was to Ephesians and Laodicea. There's just so many different possibilities. And nothing really gives absolute clarity um, as to where. So um, long story short, it's called Ephesians because people largely believe that it went to Ephesus. But it might have also gone to Laodicea or Laodicea. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and what we see in Paul with these letters is we see beliefs and lifestyle completely connected. They are un, you are unable to separate them from one another. Um, <clears throat> in other words, I know some pastors like to only mention lifestyle. If it doesn't apply to you, don't teach it. And as other people get way off onto just theology. Let's teach more doctrine. Whereas Paul connects the two. Neither of those two people are right. We need proper beliefs in order to have a proper living. They're connected. You can't separate beliefs from lifestyle. Um, we don't do the things for salvation. We don't do the same things for this, that, and the other thing. We, we do the things uh, out of our faith. Does that make sense? And you can tell the difference between when you're doing something thing that it saves you and when you're doing something um, understanding that you're obeying God. Does that make sense? Like, for instance, the Jews thought that they were doing the works so as to earn salvation. But the works of the law never never gave salvation. Does that make sense? So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, and as you seek God more and more, the, the works will come naturally. Um, as far as what the situation is, um, the area, regardless of whether it's Ephesians or Laodicea, or Ephesus or Laodicea, um, it was a very Roman area and strongly tied to the cult. Um, I mean, there's a lot more that could be said, but um, that's basically the, the summation of the book. So then the theme is to stand in Christ against wickedness. Stand in Christ against wickedness. There's wickedness all around us, everywhere we go. It doesn't matter if we're not, if we don't live in Ephesus or Laodicea. Yeah. Nowadays, there's still wickedness all around us, and we have to stand in Christ. We have to stand in truth. Um, yeah. Um, Ephesus is actually, after Jerusalem is destroyed, John moves with um, Jesus' mother, Mary, uh, to Ephesus. So that's actually, um, I mean, not really important for the, to understand the Bible, but it's still interesting. So after um, this, uh, Paul kind of, the, the imprisonment kind of drags on it, and Paul starts kind of losing hope. And not hope in God, hope that he'll ever get out. Um, and so Philippians is written about this time where he's just kind of like, maybe I won't be getting out. You can just kind of hear that tone in his voice. Um, and so this is sometime around 67. Paul has lost some optimism of being released, but encourages and thanks Philippi regardless. There are just some different things he wanted to pr protect the Philippians from and whatnot. Um, as far as uh, Philippi, it was a very progressive town. It was on, it was on the waterfront, um, as I said right here. Boop. Um, and so it, it, it was the places that were port places, port places, um, they, uh, they tended to be more progressive because they got um, news faster, culture faster. They got just flooded with, with different you know, things all the time. Whereas the places that, that were kind of landlocked and took some time to get to or maybe had a higher uh, Jewish concentration, that kind of stuff, tended to be a little bit less progressive. I mean, think of it like in America today. California and New York are, are probably the two most progressive places in America. 
and they're kind of our big equivalent of port cities. You know what I mean? They're, they're our big, or, or, or they're our big uh, culture centers. Most uh, uh, fashion things in New York, for instance, I mean, you know, upscale, you know, that, that's how people think of it. It's progressive. It's the next step. Um, for instance, you don't think of the next step of culture coming from, or fashion, coming from Kansas, you know, you know what I mean? So it's kind of the same idea uh, for this. Um, and so the theme of Philippians is rejoice always, um, which must have been a struggle for Paul considering the, the, the context. But then um, after this, he's released shortly after, and uh, he really doesn't waste much time. He goes from Rome down to Crete, assuming, um, and then to Nicopolis, then over uh, possibly to Spain and, and England area, then, then back over to Rome where he's arrested again. But some of, a lot of this is speculation. Um, it's traditionally went down, went over to Spain, and it can be assumed that he went to Crete, but ultimately we don't know for sure. We know that he was in Nicopolis because um, he mentions that in one of his letters, I think the letter to Titus, I think. Um, uh, so it was, Titus and First Timothy were written about the same time at about 63. Uh, what had happened was, uh, I just mentioned this, Paul was freed from his, his imprisonment, and, and he really just hops right out there and strengthening the, strengthening the, the church. He sends Titus to, to the church at Crete, and he sends Timothy to the church at Ephesus. And he just kind of uh, starts strengthening them, starts uh, trying to expand the gospel too, going to places that he's never been, just kind of waste no time in, in getting things rolling. Um, and and I, I know these letters have, have specific names to them, Titus, Timothy, but um, they were most likely, um, not most likely, they were re uh, read to the whole church as well after the initial person had read it. Uh, and they became very widely circulated after Paul's death as well. Um, uh, so as far as where did the church on, of Crete come from, it really doesn't, we don't really know. Um, we just know that whenever Paul wrote Titus in the 60s, it was already a thing. Um, so... Um, the theme of Titus then is devote yourself to good. A lot of the things of, of what these books are about, you really just have to read it for yourself. I mean, no class is going to be able to explain it. You have to keep reading. And what's going to happen is you're going to read, and some, you're going to read something confusing, and you're going to be tempted to just kind of delve into that one passage. Don't give in to temptation. Keep reading through. Keep reading through. And then, after you kind of got an idea of stuff, then go back and study and see if what you think a passage means relates to the rest of Scripture, um, or whether it contradicts the rest of Scripture. Because if it contradicts, you know that your understanding of it is wrong, and if it doesn't, you know that your understanding is right. And I know that sounds kind of circular, but without giving a full-length college class or multiple full-length college classes on biblical interpretation, it's just not really worth getting into in this class. So 1 Timothy was written right around the same time once again. And the similar thing was going on uh, in this letter as in, as in Titus. But the church in Ephesus was, in my opinion at least, in far greater trouble than with false beliefs than the church in Crete was. It seems like uh, Ephesus just kind of had thing after thing going on with it. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, it's really similar content with Titus. They figure that Titus was written first, though, just because of the content of 1 Timothy. Um, and, and as far as some people make it out to be as, oh, the Jews were the bad guys. Well, no, Satan was the bad guy. He just used the Jews' misunderstanding of Scripture um, to turn them against uh, what God's kingdom wanted and what uh, God's kingdom. Um, but and then the Greeks were also, you know, did things too. They, they both created problems, the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews weren't any better than the Greeks. The Greeks weren't any better than the Jews. There, were, there was a lot of controversy, you know what I mean, or, or and, and misunderstandings, and, and people just kind of got confused. There are a group of Greeks called Gnostics, for instance, that, that because of them, we now have the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, for instance. Um, and then we have the Jews who were saying, hey, um, you guys need to convert to, the, to all the law, too. So, I mean... So it wasn't just one group of people who was causing a tiff. It was both of them. And somewhere around this time, Peter writes 1 Peter um, from Rome um, right before Emperor Nero starts persecuting Christians. So I, I already mentioned this before. Um, and it, it seems like his audience was largely Gentile. And what Gentile means is not Jewish. So really they could be Greek, Roman, etc., barbarian or whatever. It doesn't matter. They were not uh, Jewish. Um, to teach doctrine about Christ. They were, they were new believers, new to the scene, they didn't have any background in this stuff, 
and so Peter's trying to try and establish them and, and just uh, some basic doctrine of Christ. Um, as far as where this was, somewhere in the Asia Minor area and surrounding areas, Bithynia, Galatia, that kind of stuff. Um, and remember, these people didn't necessarily have, have Christian background. And what I mean by Christian is, is they didn't come from Judaism. They didn't come, you know, they didn't grow up their lives in the church. They were, and these were people who, who were new to, to the faith, and they were just a little bit mis, uh, confused about a few things. Um, so the theme of 1 Peter, obviously, then is persevere in persecution. Keep doing, even if what you're do, you're, you're struggling for doing the right thing, still do the right thing. And I find it funny that, that 1 Peter was written to a, a pretty new basic believer and yet how many of us actually have this lesson down that I'm going to keep doing right even though I'm persecuted as I was doing wrong um, so that takes us to Second Timothy what had happened uh, after Paul goes, back, goes to Spain possibly and over there he comes back to Rome and he's re-imprisoned around 64 to 68 uh, and Timothy and Second, Second Timothy and Second Peter are both written around this time so Paul gets in prison again and he gives Timothy his last statement which is Second Timothy um, in a very very personal letter if you read through Second Timothy it's, it's very very plain that this is very um, near to Tim Paul's heart he's getting ready to to, pat and to 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 be put to death he knows it's coming and he's just kind of making his peace with it and making sure that Timothy is all set and the theme of Second Timothy really is pass it on. Keep doing the work. Don't let my death end this. You know, keep going until Christ comes back. Make disciples who will make disciples. Um, and then Second Peter um, is killed right around the same time for right around the same uh, cause, uh, Emperor Nero. Um, so that puts us sometime before 68. We don't really know exactly. But the situation, the church in Colossae is in danger of combining heresies with the truth. I am sorry, that is not supposed to be there. Um, what the situation actually was, um, this must have gotten stuck in from the last uh, slide about Colossae. Um, what had happened was, um, maybe I bet it somewhere else. No? Okay. Um, what had happened was, uh, um, Peter was trying to correct some, um, oh, there it is right there, I'm sorry. I did conclude it. For whatever reason, though, the, the page got messed up. Don't pay attention to the situation right here. That's part of another slide that we already went over. That's from Colossians. Um, right here is the situation. Peter is attempting to resolve false teachings before his death. That's what the situation is. Um, and you have to realize that a lot of times things weren't strict religions. Oh, these are the Gnostics, for instance. Oh, these are the, these are a group of Jews. Oh, these are a group who believed in, in the mixed, mixed myths. Well, it's not like that. A lot of times it was what's called a conglomeration of religions. In other words, they took a bunch from a bunch of different things and just kind of shoved them together. And that was part of the Roman culture. So for even the Christian converts, it must have been very difficult to remember, no, 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 no. This is the truth, and this alone is the truth. Um, as far as St. Peter, he uses... Uh, Jude's letter that we talked about, I, mean, I mentioned this before, but Second Peter 2 is actually um, a, in large part Jude's letter. Um, uh, slightly reworded, but not much. Um, and at this time, people were, were starting to ask the question, where is Christ? So in Saint, excuse me, in Second Peter, Peter um, it, it mentions that Christ is active and he's coming soon. This is not something that, that God has forgotten. This is something that God will, God will bring about in his timing. Um, which takes us to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, um, all written around the same area, possibly in the order that, that they're in your Bible, 1st, John, 1st, 2nd, John, 2nd, and 3rd, John, 3rd. In which case, if they if they are preserved in the same order that they were written, you can see the church of Ephesus gra declining. 1st John seems a little more hopeful than 3rd John, and then you get to the book of Revelations, and it mentions Ephesus losing their losing their first love. So if the, this is all in chronological order, the Gospel of John, then 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, then Revelations, you can see Ephesus slowly, Ephesus slowly declining, um, which is a sad thing because John tried so hard to pull it out of that. But Craig Blomberg already elaborates a lot on this from, in his book From Pentecost to Patmos. Um, so the first John was written to, to Ephesus as a whole, um, Ephes, the Ephesus church as a whole. Second John was written to a house church in Ephesus, and third John was written to Gaius, a person in a house church in Ephesus. Um, kind of narrowing the focus there. Uh, as far as what the situation was, Ephesus continues to be plagued by false teachings, and it's just not going very well. Um, we don't know if, if they ever snapped out of it or not either. Um, the theme of 
of 1st and 3rd John is the test of spiritual life. How do you know you're saved? The evidences of those things. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of a contrast between John's gospel and John's first letter. 1st John and the gospel of John, okay? On one hand, the gospel of John talks about Jesus being God. Very evident. Very plain theme. Uh, God empowers believers to do, to do the work. Uh, eternal life is attained. He already talks about you are saved. See what I mean? And then uh, the Holy Spirit is a guide in, in the Gospel of John. But then in 1 John, probably because of false teachers, he had, to, he had to not modify what he was saying, but kind of bring clarity to it. Jesus was God, yes, but he was also human. Um, God empowers believers to do the work that he has called them to. Yes, however, no one is sinless. Um, yes, you are saved, but um, you will be saved. It's kind of like a, it's already attained, but it is being attained. So that kind of makes sense, kind of maybe a little bit confusing. Uh, the Gospel of John, you know, eternal life, it, it, you are saved now. Whereas First John talks about you will be saved. You know what I mean? Uh, a little more distance. Um, so are you Christian? Yes. However, keep in mind that anybody can walk away from the Christian walk before... Um, before the end, in which case it would have, their walk would have been for nothing. Um, so whereas the Gospel of John talks about the Holy Spirit being the guide, in First John he talks about testing the spirits. Not everything is of God's Spirit. Um, just be wise and be discerning about that. So then um, we see John kind of contrast with what some of the false teachers are saying. Whereas John says in First John, keep the commands, the false teachers are saying, hey, we're sinless and perfect. Whereas John says, keep commands, but love also, the teachers are saying, hey, live lawless, live however you want. Um, whereas uh, John says Christ was fully human, the false teachers say Christ only appeared as human, which is why John says Christ came as water and blood, whereas the false teachers said that the Spirit descended on Jesus at the baptism, but left before the crucifixion. Um, so I you can see how that would uh, that would damage uh, theology. That would damage um, what they were what they were believing in and hoping in, um, which takes us to to the uh, letter, uh, if you want to call it that, the book, whatever you want to call it, of Revelation. This was the last book written by John, and the last um, book both in the order of your Bible and also the last chronological book in your Bible. Um, written the last in the events occurred last, yeah. Um, and it was written about 96. Paul, or John, had been uh, exiled to an island called Patmos um, after, as tradition says, they failed to kill him by, um, I think it was hot oil or something like that. Um, it was written to the churches of the Asia Minor, as, minor, as is obvious from the first couple of chapters of Revelations, where he says, you know, to the church in Ephesus, to, to the church in here and the church in here. Um, as far as what the situation was, um, it was it, Revelations was written to encourage um, Christians who, who had been burdened by both Christ's delay and come in returning, and uh, the persecution of the saints. Um, as far as understanding Revelations, remember that it's not literal unless specifically stated to be literal. A lot of people have tried to go through Revelations, and I have all the answers of Revelations, which is very unlikely, but even if you do think that, just be careful. It's, it, it shouldn't be seen as literal unless specifically said. Okay, There's a lot of imagery and a lot of symbolism in Revelations. But then also, um, uh, when you're reading it, grasp the idea of what it's saying and don't try to trip over all the specifics of what it's saying. Does that make sense? Um, rather than the, rather than what does this mean? What does this mean? Is this Israel? Is this is this America? Is this just understand the idea of it, okay? Um, and be very gracious with understanding Revelations. It's been something that people have been tripping over for years. The events in Revelation are not necessarily in chronological order. That is, they are not necessarily in the order that the events actually happened in. Um, so be careful of, of saying, oh, this is symbolic for this, or this means that. Just be very careful with that. And um, for the context, uh, don't take things out of context. Like, for instance, in Ezekiel, for instance, it mentions two eagles. And so people would say, oh, the two eagles, that must stand for America. Or, you know, and, and no, 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 no. You have to understand what it meant back then to those people before you can understand what it meant now. For instance, the elect lady would have been like maybe either Israel or the church, see what I mean? That kind of stuff. Rather than elect lady, oh, he's talking about one woman, see what I mean? understand it and as it meant to them back then in revelations i think it's like chapter 12 he talks about the dragon and, and the woman and and a, and a child who's born and, and it's just kind of like what is he talking about and then the dragon's thrown out of heaven and he goes off in a rage 
what is he talking about? Well, it's very kind of simple. It, uh, the, the woman, who is Israel, gave birth to Jesus. Jesus was whisked away to heaven, and Satan was unable to touch him. And so he got thrown out of, out of, out of heaven. He was defeated. He was defeated by Christ's victory, um, and so he is attacking the church because of his because of what has happened. He's, he's irritated about it, um, and and see so, you know what I mean. Grasp the idea of it without necessarily having to know every single specific of it, um, and and so the basic thing of Revelations is that God is in control, and um, so just some some last uh, things for this class. Uh, a good bibliography here. I, I've drawn from these books. A lot. Um, Encountering the New Testament by L. Will and Yarbrough. Encountering the Old Testament by Arnold and Bayer. Grasping God's Word by Duvall and Hayes. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Fee. Jesus and the Gospels and From Pentecost to Patmos by Craig Blomberg. And The Promised Plan of God by Walter Kaiser. There's a lot of other ones that I could mention, but these ones I think really um, did the most for uh, a basic understanding uh, for me when I was studying, um, you know, back when I was in college, but also. Um, really has had the most applicable stuff um, in it. Um, so I hope that this class has really explained the Bible for you, helped you to, to, to get in there and study more. Um, please post any comments below, and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you.